All right, so we're closing up the series that I've been preaching on in the seven churches of Revelations chapter 2 and 3. So um, we're closing out with the church of Laodicea, and we decided just to reread chapter 3. It's good. You know, the, I'll, I'm going to reiterate a couple things from the series in general. One of the reasons why we've been doing this is to look at all of the different warnings and these letters to the churches where they've been getting um, commended on the areas that they've been good at and then warned and, and oftentimes warned very severely on the areas where they're not doing so well. And Laodicea is another church that doesn't have anything to report of good news. This is a church that's about to die in God's eyes, regardless of how many people they have. This is actually a church being described here, I think is probably a huge church. Probably a lot of people going to this church. Similar to the, one, to the church where you know, they have a name that they live, but they're dead. This is gonna fall into a similar category as that church. So we wanna look at this church and we wanna see, and, and really it, it kind of boils down to just one main thing which ends up breaking off into a lot of other things and lots of sins and things like that that will, will come as a result. But um, just when it comes to your Christian life in general and churches, and this is where we also, you know, I'll go back to the first sermon I preached in the series. I went over how we don't believe in, in dispensational doctrine where they'll teach that all of these seven churches are different church ages and, and you know, you've got now we're in the day of the Laodiceans and stuff like that. The reason why this gains any traction at all is just because there's a lot of churches today that have the same problems that the church of Laodicea had. So this is why people pick up on it, because there's truth to that. Because there's a lot of churches out there that are very lukewarm. They're not hot, they're not cold, they just kind of are, they just kind of exist, they're real plain and neutral and don't really have much in the way of, of serving the Lord in general. They've turned more into social clubs and events to just, just talk to people once a week and you come in and you leave the same exact way and there's really no work going on for God but people just keep showing up week after week after week and it's just lukewarm. And there's tons of churches out there today like that, which is why some people will fall for the dispensational doctrine. But I've already preached on that. You can listen to the first sermon I preached in the series where I go over how it's just kind of ridiculous because where are you going to point to all of the other ages? Right? Where's the starting point? Where's the stopping point? It just, they want to just focus on this one. Well, we're going to be focusing on this church because it's, it's a big problem. And this morning, if you look down, let's reread some of these verses here, starting in verse number 14 of Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says, And unto the church, the angel, excuse me, the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, just as it starts off with every other church. I know thy works. Churches are judged by their works. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. He's saying, you're not hot, you're not on fire for God, you're also not even cold. He says, I would thou wert cold or hot. God's saying, I wish you're either just cold or you're hot. I, I don't like this, this in-between, this middle ground where you're just kind of hanging out. He says, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I mean, the imagery that, that that pulls up here in God's word is great. I mean, it's, you just picture someone taking a drink and just, you know, just spewing it like, oh, man, I don't, I don't want that in my mouth for a second. That's how God feels about this church at Laodicea. And he's giving him one last chance to repent and get right so that he doesn't have to just spit him out of his mouth and just say, man, you, you make me sick. I have nothing to do with you. Right. This is we have this verse actually above our coffee maker out there. We have some people in our church that like hot coffee. and We got some people that like cold coffee. Right. I'm one of those. Hey, cold or hot. Right. Get the iced coffee, get the hot coffee. But this lukewarm stuff. Come on. Obviously, we're, we're playing around a little bit with the coffee. But seriously, oh, it's, it's one of these things that's being used as uh, to help you understand how God feels 
about these churches. And, you know, there is no such thing as being neutral in the Christian life. There's no such thing as being neutral. Neutral is bad. Right? Now, if you're cold, that's bad in the Christian life. In the, in the, in the Christian realm, if you're just not just going off, living in the world, having nothing to do with God, but you're saved and you're just super cold as a Christian, that's not good. Okay? But what God's saying here is like, I'd rather have you cold than lukewarm and somewhere in this middle ground. What he really wants is, hey, I want everyone to be hot. I want everyone to be on fire and I want you doing something for me. But this concept of being able to, to kind of have both, you know, one foot in the world and one foot in church and stuff, it doesn't exist. And it's, it's taught against all throughout scripture. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to James chapter 1. Matthew 12, 30, Jesus said this. He said, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. He said, if you're not actively gathering, if you're not working and gathering with me, you're actually scattering. It's, you're not just doing nothing. It's not like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not scattering or I'm not gathering. He says, no, you're either gathering or scattering. There is no middle ground. You're either serving God or you're not. There's no middle, God, middle ground there. You're either on or you're off, hot, cold, that's all there is to it. If you, if you have this middle ground type of an attitude and you think, oh, well, I believe the Bible, but anytime anything comes up, you know, I'm just going to play the politician to please people. You know what? That makes God want, that, that is like being a lukewarm Christian and God wants to spew you out of his mouth when you take these stances that's real political because you believe things in the scripture that aren't popular but then you're not willing to actually say that you believe those things or you're going to make an excuse for it or, or just get real lame and not, you know, not stand up for the word of God. Joshua 24, verse 14, another famous passage. The Bible says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And I copied and pasted the wrong verse because the verse preceding that, he says, choose you this day whom you will serve, right? If the Lord be God, then serve him, right? But either way, you got to make a choice. Either way, you've got you've to decide, hey, what am I going to do from here on out? Am I going to go and, and serve and worship other gods? Or am I going to go ahead and worship the Lord and serve him? Hey, if you're going to serve the Lord, if you've chosen the Lord as your God, then serve him. Serve him actively. Do something about it. Don't just do it in, in word and not in deed. Right, right. Don't just say things and not actually do them. You end up becoming a hypocrite. Verse 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. None of this middle ground nonsense. You're in James chapter 1. Look at verse number 5, James chapter 1. The Bible reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And it shall be given him. What a great promise. Hey, if you're lacking wisdom, if you need some knowledge, go to God. God wants you to be smart. God wants to give you wisdom. God wants to give you the truth from his word, he wants you to understand it. He wants you to know it. He wants you to live by it. He says, just go to him and you know what? He'll help you out. He'll give it to you. He'll open up your eyes. He'll enlighten your mind to the truth. But look at what the next verse says, verse six. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So this is referring to the concept of being double-minded. Yes, no, oh, I don't know. This is that indecisive middle ground area. You're not cold. You're not hot. And that's why the Bible says, you know, a double-minded man, they're unstable in all their ways. You can't trust them for anything. Because you know, one day, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to go to church. Next day, no, I'm not going to go. Oh, I really want to go. No, I don't want to go. They're unstable, unreliable. 
You can't depend on someone like that. He's saying, here, look, you lack wisdom, you want wisdom, go to God. And no, he's going to give it to you in faith. Trust him. Ask him. But don't go going, well, uh, God, uh, will you, can you give me, help, help me understand things? And well, I don't know if he's going to do it because, you know. No, you have to go to the Lord, trusting him, believing him, believe his promises. If he says something, you better be sure you can bank on it and be true. Just as much as you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can bank on that, trust that 100%. I mean, that's how you get saved. You have to trust Him completely as be, to be your Savior. Well, if you trust Him to be your Savior, if you trust Him with your soul, trust Him with everything else too. Trust Him in all of His words. How about you trust that the Word of God is true from Genesis to Revelation? I mean, you're trusting Jesus Christ. You know what another name for Jesus Christ is? The Word. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Jesus Christ is the Word. We have the Word of God. Obviously, physically, in, in a, you know, printed in a book, we call this the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God is the truth and the light. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is the Word. So just as much as you can trust Jesus Christ with everything, you can trust the Word of God 100% equally just as much. Right. It's just like you're trusting in Jesus when you're trusting in the Word of God. Go to this book and this Word with that level of trust so that you don't have to be a lukewarm, political, politician type of Christian that wants to pick and choose and say, well, I like what the Bible says here. Well, the world likes what the Bible says here about loving one another. But, you know, this part about, about homosexuality and sodomy, you know, people don't like that today. So I'm just going to distance myself from that. No, how about you believe every word of the book of God? Amen. Every, every word in this Bible, every word is true and, and that it comes from God. And you can have faith knowing that this is righteous and true. And that when God has punishment for, for crimes like adultery, like kidnapping, okay, like, like rape, and yes, like sodomy, that all are deserving of the death penalty according to Scripture, that God hasn't changed his mind on how serious those things are, and none of those things have been repealed and saying, yeah, you know what? It used to be that bad, but it's really not that bad anymore. No, it is that bad. God still feels the same way about those things. It's still a righteous judgment for people who commit those crimes that they ought to face. Now, obviously, we don't go around taking the law in our own hands. The Bible doesn't teach that or command that, that you just need to go and, and be a vigilante and... and and execute justice, there are people who are appointed to have that power, even according to Scripture. You read in Romans 3D, I'm not going to go through all that, that there are powers and authorities in place for the punishment of evildoers. And a righteous land, a righteous government, like the Bible says in the Old Testament, like the Bible says in Deuteronomy, if you observe these laws, and if you do these things, and if you institute God's law, you know what? You're going to be viewed on as a wise people and God will bless you and God will bless your land and God will, will, you know, provide for you. And if you don't do these things and if you don't institute them, then you're going to be cursed. You know what? That applies to everybody. But especially the nation that wants to claim the Lord. And go ahead and, and do your research, do your digging, go back into the beginning, the early parts of this country even before the foundation of the United States of America, go back to the colonies, start looking at the laws that they had on their books, and you will see how closely they resembled the Bible's judgment for, for all those things I mentioned. You could find those things that they were part of the law. And people today want to make fun of God's, you know, the Bible's commandments. How about less, like, you know, uh, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Oh, yeah, witch hunts and everything. You know, you know what? Now, obviously, you shouldn't 
start falsely accusing people if they're not guilty of something. And that's where this term witch hunt comes from and say, oh, these people aren't really into witchcraft, but they wanted to just put them to death anyway. So they're just going to accuse them of it. And it was just a quick way to get rid of people you don't like. That's why the Bible has the, the punishment of if you are a false witness against someone, then you will get the same punishment that you're trying to get on them. So if you're going to accuse someone of being a witch and that's a death penalty, then guess what? You're going to be put to death. If you're found out to be a false witness, then you die. And that combats people from just lying about other people. Obviously, nothing is going to be perfect when you have sinful man doing sinful things and people, wicked people, who want to commit crimes and do harm against people. You will always have bad people in this world, but God's system is the best. It's the best. Yeah. It came from God. How are you going to, you're going to, oh, no, no, we got a better way. We're going to improve upon God's plan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know better than God. Right. Don't think so. But the reason why this nation was blessed so much is because it was a nation that, that did hold to God's laws and exalted the Lord and, and took seriously the the judgments that he gave here now i mean pff, forget about it you we can't even get a, a stinking pedophile put to death let alone even locked away in prison for life yeah. i mean they're back out on the streets going defiling abusing being predators on other kids in in a very short period of time right. it's a shame it's a shame to even i mean that that alone in addition to all the other shameful acts that are going on with the, the murder of babies and everything else going on in this country. I, but I, you know what? I'm devolving. I don't want to get into all of that. It's a little bit outside the scope of the sermon this, eve this morning. But here's the thing is that that culture that has been so permissive and allowing and steering away from the word of God is also in the churches. Because most of what I said isn't popular today. It's not what people, you know, I get criticized all the time for these beliefs. But you know what? God said that I'm not supposed to be lukewarm. Amen. And you know what? These are his words, not mine. If, it, you know, if he makes a judgment, I'm not, it's not like this is coming out of my own heart. I'll give you all of the scripture to back up everything that I just said yep. on all of those judgments, on all of those laws. It's not, this isn't just something I dreamt up with because, oh, you don't like witches. I don't even really know any witches, okay? <laughs> it's not that I have this thing against them personally or something. Some witch did me wrong somewhere and now you just got a vendetta. No, I just believe the word of God. Amen. And I believe it to be true. And if God thinks that a crime like that or people you know, participating in things like that is that bad, I'm going to trust him. Just as much as I trust Jesus Christ to save my soul, I'm going to trust it that much. That much. Because it's worthy of that much. And you know what? These laws I'm bringing up, they're not like, well, you could kind of read it this way, you kind of read it that way. No, it's clear. It's black and white. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. It's but if you understand the Greek and the Hebrew, and, and no, look, I understand English and I know understand that God's preserved his word and I understand very simple direct statements and commands thou shalt thou shalt not case closed I'm sorry anything else is people just wanting to it's the lukewarms wanting to say they believe the Bible but they don't really they don't really so they make excuses for it Turn your foot to Titus chapter number two. Titus chapter number two. God wants you on or off, cold or hot. Don't be lukewarm. And I think, you know, a lot of people I think are kind of naturally that way. In general at least I know a lot of men are I know when I was out of church for a long time I was just out yeah. I didn't want to say I didn't even talk about 
God and the Bible and stuff. Because you know what? When you're out, just be out. When you're in, get in. Get on. Get on fire. Get on board. And I don't say, I'm not saying anyone should just get out. I want you getting out. Right? I want everyone in. But if you're going to be in, get on board. Get on fire. Get hot. I, that was great yesterday. You know, we had a lot of people here. They're on board, on fire, lots of zeal. It's refreshing. Isn't it refreshing? Because look, our church carries about its own zeal. I'm encouraged by all you. I love seeing you showing up week after week and we're continuing to do work. But sometimes, you know, you can fall into habits and we just keep going out. And you know what? Praise God, we're still going out. We're not getting, you know, drugged down. But man, you get into, into company with a whole nother group of people that are saved and they're on fire and it's newer to them. It's like, wow, that's reinvigorating. That kind of fans the flames a little bit. Like, yeah, this is great. This is awesome. And it, and it re-inspires you to go back out and understand, excuse me, the importance of all this and getting more people to do the work. And as we had a day like we had yesterday, uh, praise the Lord for that. I had you turn to Titus chapter 2, look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the grace of God that brings salvation, right, also teaches us that we should deny the ungodliness, we should deny the worldly lust, we should be living soberly, righteously, and godly. Look, you can't do that just being lukewarm. You're not going to live that kind of life just not really caring, oh, whatever. You need to be sold out on these things. Verse number 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, look at this, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So that first part that he might redeem us from all iniquity, you're saved today, he's done that. But he's not done with you. That's not all he wants to do is just redeem you from all iniquity. He also wants to purify in himself a peculiar people. Peculiar means you're different. You're not like everybody else. Lukewarm means you just kind of want to blend in as much as possible. You, you know, you're not really identifying with the people who are really hot. You don't want to identify with the people who are real cold. You just kind of want to be somewhere in the middle. And God wants to spew you out of his mouth if you're like that. He wants you to be different. He wants you to be peculiar. People go, wait, you do that or you don't do this or what? You know, yeah, because I'm different because I actually believe the Bible and I'm actually going to do what the Bible says. And he wants you to be zealous of good works. He wants you to be on fire. He wants you to have that zeal wanting to do right and serve the Lord and not just give lip service to it, but actually do it. Actually do it. All day long, you run into Christians and say, oh, yeah, this is great or that's great. But what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Are you really zealous for good works? Because that's why God saved you. That's why Jesus Christ shed his blood for you, not just to save you from your sin, which he did, but that you would be a peculiar people zealous of good works. And then verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Why can we have authority to preach these things and to preach, hey, look, God wants you to be zealous of good works because it's in the word of God. All authority, no doubt. Let no man despise thee. Don't despise me. <laughs> I'm the messenger. Back in Revelation chapter 3, so God says, don't be lukewarm. And this is an entire church full of people who are lukewarm. Not hot, not cold. I don't really want to get off into sin, but I don't really want to do anything for the Lord either. I just kind of want to live a nice, happy, peaceful life and enjoy all the worldly pleasures and just be extremely comfortable. And that's all I want to do. That's lukewarm. 
That's lukewarm. Now, we don't go out looking for fights here and looking for, for problems at all. But what happens when you serve the Lord is that those things will come your way. Right. Undoubtedly, they will. Because the Bible is like a two-edged sword that pierces, that pierces and divides even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It's so sharp. And, and when people hear the word of God, it's going to cut right through. And it's going to cut to the point that you're either going to, you know, you either love it or you hate it, right? And when you're actually preaching the word of God and not just saying, oh yeah, I believe the Bible and that's it. You know, there's nothing else after that. That's watered down. That's lame. That's, uh, that's just, you know, hey, it could be true, amen, but why don't you preach all the Word of God? Why don't you stand by all the Word of God? When you're confronted with it, why don't you stand for it? Oh, but do you believe this part? Yes. How about that part? Yes. How about you could stop asking me because I believe all of it. I don't care which page you turn to. I, yes, I believe it. And I'm going to stand by it. Because it's the word of God. Revelation 3, look at verse number 17. This is the attitude that they had. He gives us a little more insight of their, of their lukewarmness. Verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. So they think they're doing pretty good, right? Hey, God's blessed us. We've got all these goods, I'm rich, I have no wants, everything's great, right? They're real comfortable in their life. Doesn't sound like they're struggling with anything. Financially, right? As a church, financially, hey, we're, we're doing good. But that's what they care about. And this is what they're bringing up. If you're going to ask them, hey, how are you guys doing? What's your status? Financially, everything's great. They're, they're focused on their, their financial wealth, their increase of goods, and not having need of anything. But here's how God sees them as we continue reading that verse. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. In their mind, they think, Hey, I'm rich. I've got all this stuff. Everything's great. I'm not hungry. I've got it, you know, I've got it made. I've got it all. And God says, you don't even realize how wretched you are. You don't even realize that you're poor and blind and negative. Say, hey, what do you mean poor? I've got all this money. I've got my 401k. You're poor. And the things that really matter. Because all these things that you have here are going to be burned up and gone. You can't take it with you. It's going to be destroyed. It is so short of amount of time that you even get to enjoy whatever it is that you have. And the joy that you get from that stuff. He called them miserable. Because if that's the best joy you're going to have is from having stuff, that is a pretty miserable life. Because the true joy in happiness comes from serving the Lord and serving others. It truly is, like the Lord Jesus Christ said, more blessed to give than to receive. It's a fact. And if you're not aware of that, and if you don't know that because you haven't experienced it, then you're missing out on a lot of joy. Because it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's not all about you and what you can get and your goods and your riches and how big barns you can build for yourself. Flip back over to James 1 again. I'm going to keep reading in Revelation 3, verse 18. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. See, they're worried about their physical gold and, and silver here on this earth. He's saying, you know what? Here's what I'm recommending. Here's my counsel to you. Why don't you go buy of me, get from the Lord, right? Go to God and get the true riches. Why don't you go to God and get the gold that's already been tried in the fire that will last through at the judgment seat of Christ. When God gives out your rewards, he says, come to me, I'll give you some gold. 
but go to God and get your working orders in order to receive those rewards that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. There's a lot in these two verses here that I want to cover. In James 1, we're going to see here, these are a people that deceive themselves. They deceive themselves. They think, oh man, we got it made, right? We've got all this stuff, we've got all these riches, but they really don't. They, they really are miserable. They're really wretched and poor and blind and naked. But they think because they have these riches that they are so well off. They're just tricking, they're just deceiving themselves. That's all it is. We've got the truth telling us one thing, but you want to deceive yourself with the riches of this world. And when you go back to the, to the parable of the sower, it talks about people who are deceived by the riches of the world. That that's one of the people that, that they end up not producing fruit and not doing anything because the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches just draw them away so that they don't end up serving God. James 1, verse number 22, the Bible reads, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. These are the people, they're showing up to church, they're hearing God's word, but they're not doing it. And this is a problem in most churches today, that's making them lukewarm, is that they may be hearing God's word. They may have someone standing behind a pulpit and reading the word of God, although even that, it's like you might hear one verse these days, as opposed to actually getting into the word of God and studying the word of God and preaching the word of God. And you got people just preaching their own opinions, but I digress. Again, another thing, it's another cause of this problem. People need to be not only hearing the word of God, you got to hear the word of God. If you're not even hearing the word of God, then good luck. Not only hearers, but doers of the word. Doers, you got to do something with it. If you're not, you're just deceiving yourself. You're tricking yourself. Yeah. It's one thing in your head to say, oh yeah, I believe that, I agree with that. It's another thing to live by it and to walk in the way, not just assent to it in your mind that, oh yeah, that's right. Verse number 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So he's like, look, it's like looking in the mirror at your face. Verse 24, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So when you look at yourself in a mirror, you're going to be able to see all the problems, all the imperfections. You're going to see the state that you're in, right? The good, the bad, everything. You can look in a mirror and you'll be able to see, oh man, no, I got, I got all this hair growing out of my nose. This is me looking in the mirror, right? Hair growing out of my ears and all this stuff. And I got to deal with all these different things. And, um, or you've got some big boil or blister, whatever. I've got all these different things I'm looking at. I'm like, hey, but there's still some hair that's not gray. It's cool. But um, whatever it is that you see in the mirror, you know, when you go and you just say, oh, okay, great. And then you just walk away. You just forget everything that you saw. Those are the people who are the hearers of the word and not the doers. See, you can see it, but if you don't do anything about these problems that you're seeing, nothing changes. Right? I mean, I, I know it's real simple. <laughs> but if you just hear God's word, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's a sin. Oh, okay, yeah. But then you don't do anything about it. See, the Bible will shine the light on you personally. When we go through this book, if it doesn't today, maybe it will next week. If it doesn't next week, it'll do the week. You know, at some point, you're going to come across something where you've got this, this word of God as this big mirror. And I'm going to be up here reading the Word of God and preaching the Word of God, and it's going to shine on you, and you're going to be like, oh, oh, man. Ooh, I'm guilty of that. Oh, God doesn't like that? Hmm. And you'll hear it here. You'll see it like the glass. But if you don't do anything about it, if you just walk out of here and just go on with your life and do nothing 
to change and to improve and to, and to fix what was reflected back on you from the Word of God, you're just a hearer of the Word and not a doer. And you're just going to forget about it. And that's true. You can hear warnings from God's Word, and if you don't deal with it, you'll end up just forgetting about it. But the problem with that is that you're going to continue doing, or whatever the problem is, it's still going to be in your life. And when you have sin in your life, God's going to be coming down on you for that. Yeah. As a child of God, God's going to be chastening you and disciplining you and correcting you. And you're going to have to continue to go through with that until you can actually go, oh, yeah, I need to deal with this. And just do it. And don't be a forgetful here, but a doer of the word. Verse 25 says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, this is pretty interesting, too, because it talks about the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He's not a forgetful hearer. He looks into the perfect law. He looks into the word of God and he's a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed. God will bless you for that. Flip over to Luke chapter 16. So one of the first things we see there is that they were deceiving themselves because they think they're rich. They think they've got it all made. They think everything's great in their life, but it's really not. And, you know, part of the reason could very well be because they're not even hearing the word of God. I know it's a problem in a lot of churches today. You could go in, you're not even getting that mirror to see what shape you're in because you're not hearing the word of God. It's not shining that light. So people come in, they leave, same week after week, they'll say they believe the Bible, they're not reading it on their own, and they're not hearing it from the pulpit. Shame on both of those things. If you're a born-again believer, you ought to be reading your Bible every day. You shouldn't have to rely on me to hold up the mirror to your face. How about you hold up the mirror to your own face by getting your face in this book? Take the responsibility on yourself, and you know what? You'll come here, and maybe I can help clean the mirror up for you a little bit so you can see a little bit clearly. I don't know. But um, obviously, there's, there's, there's good advantages to, being, to receiving some teaching as well here at church. But it, the, the, the majority of your learning should be from your own Bible reading. Because you should be doing that every day. You only come here a couple days a week, if that. Luke chapter 16, we're going to look at some, now some of the true riches. Because remember, Jesus was telling in this letter to the church of Laodicea, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. They thought they were rich, but they're not. They're poor. So let's look at Luke 16 to get an idea of these true riches. The Bible says in verse number 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So right there he's, he's making this observation, this point, this truth, that you know the person that can be faithful in the little things, and you can be reliable and you can do them. You could do a good job, even on the smallest things. You're not cutting corners. You're not just going, yeah, whatever. Who cares? It's not that big of a deal. The people who can say, nope, this is a job that I have to do. My name's on it. I'm doing it. I'm going to do it right. The people who can do that, you can trust greater things with. But if you can't even do the simplest, smallest of tasks, you don't know, oh, you're too good for it or whatever. Who is going to want to then and try, you know, be like, you can't even do these simple jobs. You're not going to get anything better than that. Don't expect to get better. You know, and this is the mindset that kills people actually out in the workforce on the job. People who start off getting you know, entry-level, low-level jobs, and they don't like it because it doesn't pay much. They don't like it because it's not a fun job. They don't like it because you got to do work that just no one really wants to do. But the people then who act like that and just don't do the work then and they do a really bad job just because they don't like and they don't want to do it, 
You're never going to improve. You're never going to move up. No one's ever going to promote you to do anything else. Because if you're doing a poor job in these, these easy, mindless jobs that, yeah, you don't like it, but if you can't even do that, no one's going to think that you can do anything else because you're already so bad at that job. Instead, what you do is you suck it up and you work hard and I don't care if it's mopping a floor. That's right. You be the best person and say, oh, wow, I know so-and-so mop this floor because I can see my face in that floor because I've done a good, you know, whatever it is, do put your all into it. Amen. And then you know what happens? People see that and they see that you're a hard worker and they see that you care about your job and then you start getting the promotions and then you start getting more into other things. That's a worldly example, but what he's doing here is saying, look, money, that's what mammon is. Money is, is, is a small thing in God's eyes. He's like, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. God doesn't care about how much money you have, but he's saying if you can't even be faithful with that and not just be some total waster and everything else, then who's going to trust you, commit to your trust the true riches? <coughs> So whatever God's given you, you know, be faithful with that. Show that you can, you care about things. Not that it's your, you know, it's not, you're not putting your heart into those physical riches. But whatever you have, you're going to, you're going to use wisely and show discretion and discernment. Because then God's going to see, oh, okay, these little things that don't really matter. He's good at that. I'm going to give him now the true riches. I, he's shown himself to be reliable, dependable, faithful. So, okay, now we're going to get the true riches. Verse 12 says, And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, right, working for someone else, you know, treating, and, and that's another thing too, you know, a lot of, so many people, I've seen this in, in various jobs that I've had, you know, they work for somebody, and they don't care at all you know, what happens to the product that's being sold or whatever. And it's like, meh, whatever. And they could just toss it around. And those, again, those are the same people that never get anywhere. Because how can you expect to ever get your own stuff? Maybe you have your own business, have, you know, the things that belong to you ultimately, if you can't even take care of someone else's stuff. You're never going to make it there. You're never going to get there. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? But then look at verse number 13, because this is really important. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And this goes back to the, to the lukewarmness of people want to have one foot in, one foot out. I want to... I wanna, amass all this wealth and have all this money and have this comfortable life. Oh, but then I also want to serve God too. You don't get it both ways. There is no in-between. Everyone wants to have that perfect in-between. It's not there. It's one or the other. I mean, this is what Jesus said. You cannot serve God and mammon. You're either going to do one or the other. You can't do both. Pick one. Are you going to live for money? and just work to just achieve as much money as you can, or you're going to work for the Lord. Right. Now, I just want to make this clear. He's talking about who your master is, right? Money or God. God knows, and we're actually commanded, men are commanded to provide for their families. Okay, so when you work to provide for your family, that doesn't necessarily mean that your master is money, that you love the money and you're going to serve the money because your life is all about making money. But that's what he's teaching here is the people who get focused on their life is about making money and not serving God. There are people who have had wealth in the Bible because God has blessed them that were godly men, righteous men that served God. But see, the money doesn't matter to them. 
They don't care about the money. That's just, you have what you have. And look, we all have varying levels of whatever money in our own lives personally, and none of that matters. It really doesn't matter. What God wants is your heart. God wants your heart on serving Him, and He'll take care of your needs, whatever that may be, however much He gives to you versus anyone else, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He wants you serving him. That's why in verse 14 there in Luke 16, it says, And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided. See, the Pharisees heard this. They didn't like it. Why? Because they were covetous. Because covetous people love money. And money is their God. And money is their, you know, cash is their king. So our cash isn't my king. Jesus Christ is my king. That's who I'm going to serve. I'm going to work to provide for my family. I'm going to work because I'm not a sluggard. I'm going to work and do a good job at my job. But my heart is in service to the Lord. And here's how you know who your master is, is if when, when you get to those decision points of, wow, if I, if I choose to do this and serve God, I'm going to end up losing all this money. Whoever you choose really shows who your master is. When you say, okay, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. I won't do, you know, because I don't want to lose the money from my job. And it's out there and you'll be, you'll be tried. I think more and more people are going to be tried. Get ready for it. The more perverted our culture becomes and the more this cancel culture grows and people, you know, the, the alphabet mafia want to go, go around and, uh, and the alphabet animals want to go around and, and just shut people down and find out where you work and, and tell your boss what you actually believe. Yeah, you actually believe the Bible. I'm going to try to get you to lose your job. And you know what? You have a choice. Are you going to be ashamed of the, of the Word of God? Are you going to be ashamed of Jesus Christ? Are you going to deny Him and deny, oh, no, no, I don't really believe that? Or are you going to say, yes, I believe that. Yes, I stand on that. And if you're going to fire me, fire me. You know what? You can take your money. God will take care of me. But I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not here. You know, there's a lot more to life than just worrying about your money. Who is your master? Who do you really serve? I serve God. Yeah. He's first and foremost. I'm going to work jobs. I'm going to do things and try to earn money to provide for my family. But I serve God. That's right. I'm not out to serve money. If you're, gonna, if you're out to serve money, okay, hello, compromiser. Because yeah. that's, that's what you're going to have to do. Because you cannot serve God and money. You won't be able to make it making tons of money and also serving the Lord. It's not going to happen. There's going to be a breaking point. Flip back to Luke 12. I have to get through this kind of quickly. Very familiar passage of Scripture. I love this Scripture. We need to be reminded of this, I think, just regularly anyways, these great truths. It was, I mean, this is the type of truth. This is the thing that's killing a church. The church of Laodicea is being killed because they think they have all that. They think that their, you know, their finances are great and they're just great and everything's just wonderful. And they don't even realize what bad shape they're in that they're just going to continue meeting and then God's just not even going to recognize them as a church. And I believe also this church is full of a bunch of unsaved people too. Because he's telling them, I mean, you need to be able to see, you need to wash your eyes with eyes. You need to get white robes to cover your name. You know, we'll get into that in a minute, but this is a, a church in a really bad state. Luke 12 though, let's look at some of these riches that God wants us to go after. The gold that's tried in the fire that we can buy of God Luke 12, verse 16, the Bible reads, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? 
because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Okay, that mindset. Well, I'm just going to store up all this wealth for me, and then I'm just going to eat, I'm going to drink, I'm going to be merry, I'm going to be happy, and I'm just going to enjoy retirement, and that's all I'm focused on doing. Right? This is the attitude. This is the same mindset of the church of Laodicea. This is the lukewarm attitude. This is the focus. Is he focused on serving God? Or is he focused just on himself, just being comfortable for, for his life here on earth? He's focused about him. He cares about himself. That's it. Being comfortable, amassing wealth. Look what it says in verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool! So if your plan is, well, I just want to build a bunch of wealth so I could eat, drink, and be merry, you know what God's saying to you? You're a fool. Right. You're a fool. That's what you want to do with your life. That's what your life is all about. I just want to make all this money, amass the wealth, and then I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. You're wasting your life. Foolish thing to do. He says, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So you finally got everything in order. Finally got all those ducks in a row, and then boom, you're dead. Don't even get to enjoy one day of it. Instead of focusing on all that garbage, you should have been focusing on the real retirement plan where God will give you riches in heaven that last forever. Amen. Not five years or 10 years or maybe 20 years, but in eternity. Verse 21, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself, look at this, and this is important, and is not rich toward God. And it goes back to who your master is. Because I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having some money put away for hard times to get you through. But that's not the focus. You're not covetous. You don't care about it. You're just going to be wise with what God has blessed you with. You're going to put it away. You're going to use it wisely. You're going to, you know, whatever. But your focus is on being rich toward God. Amen. If you're not rich toward God, you're a fool. Because anything else is just going to be gone. Verse 22, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. He's saying, that's not what this life is all about. He knows you need those things. But he's saying, don't be so focused on that stuff. Don't be focused on what threads you can wear. And oh man, I've got the, I don't even, I don't even know what's popular anymore. <laughs> Who's still about his Armani or the, the Tommy Hill fit? I mean, that, that's a long time ago when that was popular. I don't know. I don't even know anymore. When I was more in the world, I just knew, you know, you know those things. You just know, like, oh, man, yeah, these things, these are great clothes or whatever. You got this name brand, that name brand. Why do you even care about that? Right. You need to be dressed. Your body needs to be covered from the environment around you. That's what clothes are for. You can do work and not get hurt and not get cut or whatever and just be protected. Don't worry about who what stinking name brand, what, what person you're giving all your money to because you're paying five times what you should be paying for the same exact thing that doesn't have that logo on it or whatever. Right. I'm digressing again. <laughs> but that's not what life is all about. The life is more than meat. The body is more than raiment. Verse 24, consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If, then, if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
God's saying, you know what? The lilies have better clothing than even the richest person in the entire world had, King Solomon, that had every resource at his fingertips. He could get whatever he wanted. And money wasn't an issue for him. And the clothing, the threads that he wore, it's not even like a lily. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be of doubtful mind. There's a doubtful mind again, right? People who are unstable because they're tossed about and, and just they're, 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 they're double-minded. Just trust the Lord. Amen. Trust him. Don't waver. When he says to serve him, serve him. If there's threats of losing income, losing job, whatever, just serve him. He'll take care of you. Right. I know it can be scary. I faced it. I know what it's like to have an entire family relying on you to feed them and to have someone come to you and fire you because of what you believe. But you know what? Stand strong with God because he'll take care of you. Yeah. Try him. Try him and he will come through undoubtedly, unwaveringly, every single time. Every time. Right. Don't worry. Amen. And look to other people who have stood up and God has taken care of them and continues to take care of to this day. I'm not alone. There's many other people who have done the same thing. And it's probably one of the reasons why I even was able to make the stand I, I could because I've seen other people do it. And we should have the faith to not have to see someone else go through it because this says it. That's right. But get encouragement from those that you do see as well. But trust this book. Trust the word of God. He will never steer you wrong. Ever. Ever. Verse 30, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take care of you. Let God be your master, not money. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you great treasures. God wants to give you things in heaven and the gold that, that abides the fire. Verse 33, Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He's saying, get rid of all the stuff that you have. Sell it. Get rid of it. Give it away. Who cares? Because that's not what matters. And if that's going to be causing you to be stumbling and, and focus on that stuff, just get rid of it. Because God will still take care of you. And just focus on serving Him. All right, I'm going to skip over this part where it talks about them being blind and naked. Nakedness in the Bible is always associated with shame. By the way, I was just going to cover that briefly. I know it's at the end of summer now, but people like to walk around naked, in, in, at least in biblical terms. So what do you mean they're naked? Well, when people are walking around in their underwear, okay, they're naked. And when you're exposing your thighs and you're exposing the area about your loins, you're naked according to the Bible. And you could do that for homework. You could look up Isaiah 47 and you can see where their nakedness is exposed when they make bare the leg and uncover the thigh. So it's what the Bible teaches. But let's go to verse number 19 in Revelation 3. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Almost done. Hebrews 12. <coughs> Revelation 3, 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. This is the comforting part, actually. I mean, this church is getting a, a stern rebuke. A stern warning. They're being chastened by God. You know, God's saying, you guys think you're great. I mean, imagine that, thinking everything's so good. We've got this great standing with God. And God's telling you the exact opposite. Like, no, you're not rich. You're poor. 
No, you don't have joy. You're miserable. No, you know, you're naked and blind. Okay, sin has blinded your eyes. And you think you could have this lukewarm life. I want to spew you out of my mouth. I'm not pleased with you at all. How many people have this air of, of confidence thinking, oh, God loves them so much. And they're not doing anything for him at all. And in reality, God's going, I want to spew you out of my mouth. Yeah. But the comfort that you can take when you hear these types of messages is when he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If you're getting rebuke and chastening from the Lord, take comfort knowing that he loves you because you wouldn't be getting that if he didn't love you. Right. He would just leave you to your own devices. That's why... Parents that love their children, parents that love their children will discipline them, correct them, rebuke them, and teach them the right way. Children, parents that don't love their children, let them go off and do whatever they want. And the reason why parents do that is because it's too hard. Oh, I've got these other things to do. Other things are more important. Oh, they did that. Oh, whatever. I don't want to deal with that. Oh, they're getting in trouble here. Pfft. Just don't do that in front of me. Go up. Those parents don't love their children. They may say they love their children, but they don't. You could say it in word, but if you're not loving them indeed, you don't love them. Hebrews 12, verse 5. The Bible reads, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Every son. Every son gets disciplined. You're born again, child of God, today. Guess what? You're going to be getting punished by God at some point in your life. Because he punishes every son. Because none of his children are perfect, and we all need correcting, yeah. and it's going to come. Just as sure as every other child physically that grows up needs correction. They all do. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. That's why God's given us the rod of correction to drive it far from him. But take comfort knowing that God loves you if he's chastening you. Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. He's dealing with you as family. You're a son. He loves you. Yeah, you don't like getting the spanking. You don't like getting chastened. You don't like getting that discipline at the time. But you can still know in the back of your mind, you know what? I brought this on myself. It's my fault. At least God loves me enough to put me through a harder time or this punishment because if he, if he just let me just get away with everything, then I'd be worried, as it says here, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not, in verse 8, but if he be without chastisement. So if, you, if, you're, if you're able to get, if you're, and I'll say this too, look at what it says, but if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. If you can go off and get into whatever sin, and you're never going getting punishment from God, like you're never having these bad things happen to you as a result, you might want to check that you're even born again. That you're even a child of God. Because if you never, ever, 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 ever have gotten chastised and you just, nope, nope, you're a bastard, you're not a son. Because God will discipline all of his children. It happens. Now, it's not always immediate timing or something. It's not like you sin and it's like, boom, like immediate. But it ought to be there. I mean, I can think back times in my life where, uh, and here's the way it works, too, because you're going to be like, well, how do I know if it's of God or not? You'll know. You'll know. Because it's going to be not normal what's going to end up happening to you as what would happen to everybody else. 
I remember getting severe punishment on something that I had done that was a crime that I was punished for a long time ago, something I did a long time ago. And the punishment handed down on me, like I was expecting to get what everybody else gets. First offense, nope. And that lasted years. Legal problems for years over something that in the world, if when it's done, it's done. Those are the types of things, okay, that, that you'll experience as a child of God. And man, what a headache. What a bunch of problems to have to deal with. But it means that God loves you and he wants to make it painful so you don't do it again. So you could learn from it and just avoid it. Because here's the thing, if, if you start doing bad things and you don't have, it's not really a painful experience, you'd be a lot more likely to continue going down that path. And that's what you know, as parents, you look at your children and they start doing things. It's like, no, 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 we're going to cut this off right now. I don't want you going down, even, you know, taking these steps down this path. We're going to deal with this now. You're going to realize, hey, you start going this way, it's going to be bad now for you because in the end it will be bad if you can't catch it early on. And you know what? That's what God wants to do for you too. He wants to catch you when you're going down those paths and, and end up getting you some chastening and some punishment so that later on you can catch it. And he gave fair warning to all these churches. Let's learn from all these churches. Let's not become lukewarm. Let's not lose our zeal. Let's not try to fit in with the world and say, no, I don't want to be a peculiar people. I just want to, I want to have all these riches and money and wealth and that's all I care about. We do that as a church. God's not even going to recognize us as a church anymore. We need to maintain that zeal. And you know what? Try to help stir up and fire up other people to become more zealous. You know, zealous is, being zealous is infectious. We all experienced that yesterday. It's infectious. It's great. And I love that. Hopefully we are as much of encouragement to them as they were to us because, I mean, that was, that was so great being around a whole bunch of people that are fired up about serving God. And that's the attitude we need to keep. We need to make God our master, make sure we're serving him, Keep ourselves unspotted from the world as much as possible and be a peculiar people. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great information, all the great um, teachings, instruction that you've given to these various churches. Lord, help us to learn from, from their mistakes and to learn from their victories, Lord, that we can be pleasing in your sight. I pray that you would please continue to build this church, add the members where you see fit, dear Lord. Help us to become just a, a, a fully functioning body that can just do your work and, and do your will here on earth, dear Lord. Help us to reach people and to not be focused on ourselves and have a mindset that just worries about us, but that we're, we're concerned with others. Lord, help us to, uh, to be able to achieve that. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.